This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 293 was recorded on October 14th, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by escrow.com, the world's most secure online payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Discipline ETF founder Colin Roche joins me as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss the debt ceiling debacle, why a platinum coin supposedly solves perpetual motion and buys a free lunch for deficit spending, where inflation is headed, and much more. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment when Patrick's chart deck is titled Breakout. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Eric, let's jump straight into this S&P 500. After spending the last month consolidating a big update today, what's your take on uh, the S&P 500 trading here above 4,400? Well, as I said last week, Patrick, I think that this is the buy the dip situation. We went a little bit lower than the 50-day moving average, but we're, we're in the recovery now. The thing is, we're not there yet. We're not out of the woods. And I don't think that there's any reason to assume just because we had a really big up day on the S&P today, as we're speaking right now, this is before the close, we're still hovering right on those intermediate term moving averages. The 55 and 34 day moving average are right around 4421, 4422. And that's exactly where the price action is. Now, what we've got to wait for now is higher highs and uh, a breakout above these intermediate term moving averages. Plenty of opportunity for this to be a bull trap, Patrick, when we end up seeing the market roll over and move lower from here. So I don't think the, the jury is out quite yet, although at the moment the chart's looking reasonably bullish in the short term. All right. Well, let's touch on that dollar index because we really saw strength in the dollar for pretty much the last three months. But we've now approached the uh, 2020, at least the back half of 2020 highs around this 94 and a half, 95 zone. It seems to at least have stalled the dollar's advance here. Is this just a matter of uh, us uh, testing the top end of a trade range and coming back off of here? Or do you think there's more room for upside on the dollar from here? Well, Patrick, for perspective on this, we really need to look at a chart that shows a couple of years of price data. So let's come back to this subject in the post-game segment when we've got the chart deck. But briefly, I, I think we're still in a trading range. We're at the high end of the trading range now. It looks like we may be beginning a new trend, which is to the upside. That does jibe with my kind of macro concept of where things probably ought to happen. But as far as whether it's really confirmed to be happening yet, we need to see that decisive close above this 9450 level, the initial breakout level that we got to. And we tested it a couple of times, not quite there yet. I wouldn't be surprised if next week we're above it. All right. Well, we got to touch on crude oil because, Eric, I mean, it's been four days since a fresh new high. Like, what's going on? Is uh, is oil <laughs> trend over yet? <laughs> well, you know, this is, uh, I think, very interesting. I've said for many years here on Macro Voices, what's important on an inventory day like today, it was delayed because of the holiday this week, so it's Thursday instead of uh, Wednesday, it's not so much whether or not the inventory comes in above or below expectations, which is what everybody's paying attention to. Was it a bullish or a bearish surprise? What's much more important is how the market responds to that. And what we saw today was a really, really bearish inventory report. Crude oil building a massive 6 million barrels at a time when we were expecting drawdowns. Cushing, Oklahoma was the only drawdown on the board, drawing down 2 million barrels. Gasoline drawing down 2 million barrels, and distillates also a drawdown, only a de minimis 24,000 barrels. The point is, the drawdowns in finished products don't offset the crude build, and this is a bearish report. The price went straight down for all of 10 minutes or so, 
hit the five-day moving average, bounced, and now we're already above where we were when the data came out. So it says to me this market really wants to move higher. We're shrugging off what would normally be very bearish data, uh, surprise inventory data, and so forth. Meanwhile, U.S. production ticking up to 11.4 million barrels. That also should be bearish that we're increasing U.S. production, but still, the price is so resilient. I think this market has a lot of room left to go in it. I'd like to look at a long-term price chart though, Patrick, so that we can talk about what a measured move would look like if this correction that I think we're just now ha- have come out of, what if that was the halfway point in this overall rally? It takes you over 100. Let's take a look at that in the post game. Now, Eric, for those of our uh, listeners that follow your time spreads, uh, you, uh, you were telling me that there was some sort of changes that were happening here in the curve. What's going on? Crazy shit is going down in the term structure of crude oil, and nobody that I can find has figured out what's going on. Normally, as you're approaching expiry, what's happening is the those contracts all have to be closed, and if there's a big backwardation, it tends to come in toward expiry as everybody who's rolling their their positions forward has to roll from both sides. It's kind of a chicken and egg situation into that roll period. Normally, what you see is that expiring contract is kind of losing value. That's the expiring spread contract, which in this case is what we call the XZ spread. That's between November and December. All of a sudden, last Friday, it absolutely blew up from about 28 cents all the way to uh, at one point a dollar ten or so was absolutely crazy, and we thought, oh my gosh, there's got to be a spill on the Keystone Pipeline. There's got to be something that is disrupting the physical oil market that is causing a huge panic to occur in Cushing, Oklahoma, where the storage is. All I can find, the ARBs are open to the Gulf Coast. There's a lot of oil flowing out of Cushing. There's some concern there, but I don't see anything that says at 9.30 in the morning on Friday, all of a sudden something changed, and everybody freaked out in the first four one-month calendar spreads at the beginning of the curve blew up like crazy. Now, part of what's going on here, I think, is this continued, and it really got bad on Monday. Columbus Day is a very, very special situation in the futures market, and I bet there's a few listeners that don't know this. If you have a day like Columbus Day when the futures market is open but the banks are closed because it's a bank holiday, what that means is, yes, you can have a margin call in the futures market where you have to meet that call with a same-day wire and you can't send the wire because the bank is closed. The manipulators know this and they know that Columbus Day is the day to really yank positions around because they know that it's impossible for big traders to back their positions by wiring money in. So if you are a serious futures trader, be sure to have plenty of money in your account before these holidays like Columbus Day and I think uh, Veterans Day, maybe one too, where you have a market day where the, the futures market is open and the banks are closed. It's a really ripe day for manipulation to happen in the market. And I think that's part of what's going on here with crude oil time spreads at the front of the curve. If anybody has more insight than that, I know about Norco. It's not big enough. I, I can't figure out what would really drive this dislocation in the front of the uh, crude oil term structure. So if we have any listeners that know more about this than me, I'd love to hear from you. All right, well, let's move on to gold. And here we are at the 1800 mark, the one that we talked about last week. Uh, Certainly a little bit of strength, uh, weakness in the dollar might be contributing to that. What's your take here? Do you think gold can turn around meaningfully here or is this just a fake out? Well, I sure hope so. But Patrick, let's go back to what happened on the 3rd of September. It was actually a day uh, right after a Macro Voices podcast. I had been saying, you, you really got to wait for until we have a confirmed breakout above the 100-day moving average. And sure enough, on September 3rd, we got one. Yay, let's celebrate. It's the breakout in gold. It's all uphill from here. And then the very next day, fake breakout, reversed to the downside, and we saw a pretty significant move for the last month and a half or so of down. So what's happening next? We're right at that same spot, teetering right under the 100-day moving average. If we break out above it, let's let's wait to see it stay there for a few days. At that point, I get super bullish on the gold market. At this point, I'm a little nervous that we're right at that level where we could see another breakdown and reversal. All right, and let's uh, wrap up by uh, touching on the 10-year Treasury yield, which, uh, I mean, it printed as high, uh, high as uh, 163 earlier in the week, and uh, it's been pulling back since we're back to about the 150 level on the yields. What's your take? Uh, do we still have upside on interest rates from here? 
I really don't know, Patrick. My only strong view on interest rates is I think around 170, 175 on the 10-year is where people really get nervous that they start to worry that, that, that you know there's going to be some kind of crash in the bond market or something. Uh, at least that's where the, the panic started to happen in the last phase. It'll be interesting to see is if we test that level again, is that where the panic is going to start or do we go higher this time? Uh, I don't know. As far as where it's headed, uh, I just saw Lacey Hunt. We're trying to get Lacey Hunt back on the program, by the way, folks. We're working on that. Lacey Hunt is still standing behind his view, expecting lower bond yields as the deflation continues. So it's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. Well, Eric's interview with Cullen Roche is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was brought to you by Abex, a fintech company traded under ticker symbol ABXXF on the OTCQX in the United States and ABXX on the Equitas Neo in Canada. Abex was founded on the principle of creating market-based solutions to solve the world's most challenging problems. Two of these issues in particular, the energy transition and climate change, are creating once-in-a-generation opportunities for investors. Abex is leveraging proprietary Web 3.0 technologies to digitize and accelerate the velocity and security of commodity trading markets, beginning with liquefied natural gas and carbon. Investors seeking exposure to the fintech applications powering this new era of the ESG economy can visit www.abex.tech or www.abex.exchange or check out ABXX on the Equitas Neo or ABXXF on the OTCQX exchanges. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Colin Roche, founder of Discipline Funds. Colin, it's great to get you on the program. I know you've been on the market huddle before. I think this is your first Macro Voices appearance. I want to start with something that's actually been not so much in the financial press, but the popular press. Now, I know that you are an expert on monetary theory and currency systems. That's what you've studied. That's what you know about. Please help us understand why printing a trillion dollar coin (laughs) out of platinum somehow can be convoluted to be a solution to a country that lives beyond its means on borrowed money and doesn't pay back its debt. (laughs) But seriously, let's let's try to understand the monetary theory of this because it's in the popular press and nobody's talking about why that would work or even if it would work. So the coin technically, from a legal perspective, the treasury would mint the coin and be the Federal Reserve would be able to deposit into that coin into the, the treasury general account. And that would – the way to think of it really is that it is – it's like changing the credit limit on your credit card. So if you had a, a $20,000 monthly credit limit on your credit card, well – what happens with the the debt ceiling is that basically Congress decides they're going to spend twenty one thousand dollars this month, and then we get to the twenty thousand dollar limit, and Congress is like, "Oh, guys, look, we can't, we don't have the ability to actually do this thing that we want to do because we have this self imposed credit limit." Well, the coin basically takes that extra thousand dollars, it deposits it into the account, and then all of a sudden we magically found this money that the the literally the printing presses already have. And so to me, it's one of these like legal sort of, you know, loopholes that exists and doesn't really solve anything that is, you know, the root cause of the problem that exists. The root cause of the problem is that the government spends, decides to spend way too much before we actually get to that credit limit. So it's not irrational to have a credit limit. It's irrational to put in a credit limit and then say, you know, we only can, we should only spend $20,000 this month, but we're going to pass a bunch of legislation that requires $21,000 of spending that it makes no sense the way we go about this. And so this should all be done in a more proactive way. If we want to be more you know, fiscally prudent about the way we go through all of this, that should be done at the congressional level before they actually appropriate all of this spending that necessarily needs to be funded either through debt issuance or a coin after the fact. 
Let's move on to the topic that is of hot interest in the finance community, which is stagflation. Let's start because so many people are talking about this. And frankly, it's only old farts like me that actually remember (laughs) the 1970s. What does stagflation means stagnant economy with inflation? Now, wait a minute. Inflation normally means too much money chasing, you know, not enough goods and services. If the economy is stagnant, why would there be inflation? It doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah, so right, you nailed it. And it, it, stagflation is basically uh, it's when the the rate of inflation is high and economic growth is slowing, and typically it coincides with a high rate of unemployment. So something like the misery index is is very high during a period of stagflation. And um, you know, the seventies were an interesting period because in some ways they they sort of have a corollary to here where we're starting to see all these supply chain issues and a lot of the nineteen seventies inflation was in part due to supply chain issues, or at least in the in the energy sector in particular, the stagflation of the 70s was related to, to production problems. And so, you know, today the dynamic is a little different, even though there are some similarities. The biggest difference that I would argue that's going on today is that the big ones are, you know, the reason that I've argued that we're probably not likely to see a stagflation that is anything like the double digit stagflation of the 1970s is that you have these big overarching secular macro trends. The big one is demographics. You have pretty much almost around the entire globe, you have really negative declining demographic trends. That is an inherent inhibitor of economic growth. Uh, the other ones are globalization and the the big technological trends the there is a certain amount of deflation in the way that a lot of goods and services are produced because so much more of the economy is really tech and service based that the economy is not as grounded in the real economy today as it was in the 1970s and so the dynamics are similar but different but the the likelihood of seeing at least a modestly high rate of inflation going forward with a stagnant economy is is a pretty likely outcome in at least the next couple of years in my view and that puts that puts the fed in a really difficult spot because the the thing that i'm starting to get slightly worried about with the fed is they seem to be getting worried about the rate of inflation and the their their need to potentially raise rates and i wonder with a stagnant economy like this i wonder whether or not the the fed is at risk of raising rates in a way that the economy is so weak that the underlying fragility of the economy is so deep that can the fed raise rates without inverting the yield curve and causing the economy to actually, in some sense, not necessarily crash, but in some sense, slow down much more quickly than they would expect. And and so in a weird way, today is is actually also very similar to the Greenspan conundrum period and the the era of, of the housing boom, where you have a lot of asset prices that are booming and directly tied to interest rates, where we now have this coinciding worrisome rate of inflation where the Federal Reserve is potentially at a point where they feel the need to try to control the inflation. And in doing so, they could kind of make, to some degree, the same policy error that we saw leading up to the housing bubble, where they end up raising rates, raising rates you know, a lot more than maybe they could or should. And it actually causes the economy to slow down a lot faster than they want. And so you know, it's one of the problems with monetary policy and trying to, you know, tinker with interest rates over time is that you end up a lot of the times you move the dial too much in one way or the other, and you end up constantly chasing your own tail, trying to correct for past errors. And there seems to be a growing risk that we're in that sort of an environment here. Colin, the last time that we went through stagflation, and I, I think a lot of people are looking back to the 1970s as an analog of maybe what we should expect. It seems to me that the circumstances politically were completely and totally different. First of all, we had the Nixon administration, very conservative uh, Republican administration. The U.S. had just come off of the gold standard as Nixon had defaulted in 1971 on Bretton Woods. And you have an attitude where it's definitely not 
Stephanie Kelton riding in on a white horse with MMT to say, look, let's just print an unlimited amount of money. That kind of attitude toward monetary policy hadn't really blossomed yet. Or I suppose actually MMT was conceived back around the 1970s. I don't know the full history of it. It's been around for a long time. It wasn't popular then. Well, gosh, it's popular now. So it doesn't seem to me like it makes any sense to say, let's look at what happened and what the outcome was in the 1970s. I'd rather say, wait a minute, what were the circumstances at the beginning in the 1970s? And how does that compare to today where you've got a Democrat-controlled Congress and White House that enjoys spending money, and particularly the advent of a rapidly growing, uh, I'll call it affinity, among politicians for this collection of ideas called modern monetary theory. It seems to me that the circumstances are just completely different from the 1970s, and we shouldn't expect the same outcome. Am I crazy to think that, or should we be thinking that the 1970s is the, the, the reference case to look at? No, I think that I think that's a totally fair worry. And I've I've actually I've had a number of huge arguments with MMT people specifically because I've argued that they don't really have a viable theory of inflation. I would argue that they don't know what causes inflation and that they don't really have a good a good policy approach to controlling inflation should it come. And I think that we're to some degree we're seeing that come to fruition now where we're seeing all of the effects of the the fiscal stimulus from the COVID response. And, you know, my view going back was basically that I thought that the first stimulus was actually good and beneficial. I didn't, I think nobody really knew how damaging this thing was going to be. There was a real chance of a Spanish flu 2.0 where this thing wipes out 1% of the global population. And if that had happened, my view was that a, a strong fiscal policy approach up front was necessary to kind of fend off or at least to try to help people navigate some of the health crisis. I think they ended up going too far in the subsequent policy responses. We ended up, you know, the moratoriums and the the continued lockdowns and things. I think a lot of it went too far. And I think now we're seeing the ramifications of that. And I think although MMT is is definitely a growing a growing popular economic trend. I'm not convinced that it will result in sustained fiscal responses. And I think we're starting to see some of that come to fruition now where the the, the government, yes, is still planning to to spend a, a huge amount of money in the subsequent years, but or in the coming years, but I don't see this sort of perpetual spending as being at least a near-term risk. So I think you're right that in the long run, there is this worrisome trend that that the MMT movement and the number of people who are sympathetic to this are increasing in numbers. I'm not convinced that we're there yet, though. I think that the, the COVID response was a microcosm of that. And in a nutshell, I think that we're seeing you know the ramifications of that. And I think that some of the pushback is actually fairly aggressive. And I think that that, that kind of ties into the way the Fed is starting to respond, that they're now very vocally considering tightening policy in a lot of different ways. So they're talking about reducing the balance sheet. They're talking about potential interest rate hikes in the future. So, And we're finally seeing some pushback from moderate moderates in Congress as well. So you're seeing some pushback from people like Manchin and you know some of the more uh, moderate Democrats and, and Republicans who are saying, you know, look, this inflation, yeah, maybe some of the spending made sense back when things were really dire back in you know the, the early days of COVID. But we're now seeing this inflation and the, the fact that it's hurting literally everybody in, in a pretty uniform way. And so I'm not there yet where I'm super worried that we're going to have this continual fiscal response that will result in a in a perpetual sort of you know, this is the kicker with MMT is that a lot of people argue that MMT is sort of traditional counter cyclical Keynesianism. And I would argue it's actually very different. I would argue that MMT is much more aggressive in that it is a much more pro cyclical, perpetual type of foot on the gas type of approach to policy that they don't really, they're really, they're trying to, to control the car basically only with the gas or with the gas pedal. They're not. They're not using a brake like like 
John Maynard Keynes actually said we should do. I mean, John Maynard Keynes said we should run surpluses during economic booms, which is that's nothing like the type of environment that we're in now or the, the type of environment that, that Keynes actually would advocate for. So MMT is potentially something much, much more aggressive. And I'm not convinced that we're fully there yet, especially because a full MMT regime would include a government job guarantee. And that's that's potentially there, not even potentially, that is their most controversial, most dangerous idea in a lot of ways, because you could potentially have this scenario where they, they advocate for literally the government to give everyone a job. And some of these jobs are, I mean, that some of the academics have written that these jobs are like, you know, being an artist and, you know, doing things that are, most people would not pay most other people to do. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. And But the government is, in the MMT world, willing to pay people a living wage to do these things that I think we kind of know after COVID are potentially a lot more inflationary than, you know, we maybe assumed they might be, or, you know, at least some of us didn't assume it would be that way. But um, we're kind of finding out that the evidence shows that a lot of this stuff is more inflationary than people assumed, and that the inflation is not necessarily going to be transitory and easy to control in the way that I think a lot of policymakers and politicians, especially people in Congress, kind of assumed it would be. Okay, so you think inflation is set to continue, not transitory. Does it turn into stagflation? Are you convinced that's where we're headed, or is it just a possibility, or, or how do you see that turning out? Well, my view is that, I, you know, I think that the Fed really got themselves in a bind with this this term transitory because the the term transitory, it implies that we're going to see the same prices that we had in the past. And so if a beer costs five dollars, you know, at your local bar in 2020, well, the term transitory implies to people that. If that beer goes up to $21, that it will be transitory at some point in the future and you'll see your $20 beer again or something like that. And that's that's not really what the Fed meant, even though I think the general public perceives it that way. And so, you know, what the Fed really means is that the rate of inflation is going to, to be transitory, that, well, your, your $20 beer goes up to $21, it will probably be $21.25 in year two, and then $21.50 in year three. And so the, the rate of inflation is slowing, even though inflation is still rising. But they, they really got themselves in this sort of you know, communication pickle where I think now a lot of people are, are responding in a very negative way to policy because they're not communicating their concepts in a very effective way because they're talking in this wonky sort of academic manner that that's just not the way most people perceive inflation. They don't perceive inflation as the rate of inflation. They just know that things cost a certain amount and they see that that cost goes up by, you know, 20, 50 percent or whatever. And when you start telling people that that price is going to be transitory, well, I think most people know that when the price of your beer goes up $1, the likelihood of you ever seeing that old price again is extremely low or probably zero. So I think they kind of got themselves in this communication bind where I think they're likely to be somewhat right in the coming years in that I wouldn't be shocked if the rate of inflation does slow a little bit. We're starting to see that to some degree, but I think they've somewhat overestimated the the degree to which that was going to be true. And we're starting to see that kind of come to fruition in the last the last few months, especially where you're seeing things like lumber prices are jumping again and the Mannheim used car index is, is staying very elevated or, or spiking a little bit again. You're seeing the you know the number of ships in off the coast of LA remain humongous. And you're, you're going to see a lot more of this persist for longer than the Fed, I think, expected and is comfortable with. But I, again, going back to, I, I think there's a, there's a middle ground here where although we're unlikely to see a 2% rate of inflation anytime soon, I also don't think that we're going to jump up to this, you know, like double digit type of inflationary stagflation that we saw in the 1970s. But here's the kicker. 
the economy, and this is one thing that a lot of people sometimes don't talk about. There were there were some underlying currents of actual real growth in the 1970s. I mean, we had we had in a lot of ways a lot more vibrant economy then than we do now. And so when the when the rate of inflation is as high as it is with the level of growth that we have today, it feels it, in a lot of ways, it feels just as bad as it does when you have higher growth and a double digit rate of inflation. And so, it, while we're not likely to to experience a double digit inflation, the inflation that we're feeling and seeing is in a lot of ways, it feels as damaging and it's especially as damaging to the the poor and middle class because that growth doesn't filter to them in the same way that it does to say the 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 upper class and the especially the, the the wealthiest people in the country. So that's why I think a lot of the tension that we feel in the country these days is that even though inflation by historical measures is not, you know, double digit stagflation, it feels like a an entrenched stagflation because the underlying rate of growth is relatively low. Let's imagine that scenario that you're building up to where we get to some stagflation and we've got a, kind of a, a problem on our hands. Well, wait a minute. Stagflation, if the economy is stagnant, normally monetary policy response to that would be to reduce interest rates in order to stimulate the economy. But the standard monetary policy response to fight inflation is to increase interest rates. So let's imagine we have stagflation. We have a combination of inflation and at the same time a, a stagnant, weak economy. What do you think the Fed is going to do in terms of monetary policy under those circumstances? Are they going to fight the inflation? Or are they going to support the economy? Or are they going to be naive and try to do both? It's starting to look like they're going to at least – I think they're going to move somewhat cautiously. So it looks like they're going to start unwinding the balance sheet to some degree. And you know they've become so hyper-focused and hypersensitive to the financial markets that – I don't know how much they really can move because let's say, for instance, that they let's say they start to really aggressively unwind the the balance sheet and let's say the stock market falls by 25 percent. What do you think the Fed's going to do? Does anyone believe that they're going to start aggressively raising interest rates then if we have even a three or four percent inflation at that point? I'm really skeptical of that. And so they've become so hypersensitive to boosting or trying to sustain these financial market booms that we've seen that I don't know how much flexibility they really have to be able to do anything. So I, if I, if you held a gun to my head and you asked me what I think they're going to do, I think they're going to start unwinding the balance sheet. I think that the financial markets are going to start getting a little more fragile. You're going to start seeing a slowing in house price appreciation. You're going to start seeing a slowdown in, in the stock price gains. And I think the Fed will be responsive to that probably start communicating that they want to slow asset purchase or their their balance sheet unwind and you know honestly I would be they have so little wiggle room with the 30 year treasury at 2% they have so little wiggle room to be able to even increase rates in the first place i mean i'm not convinced that the 30 year is going to move that much if they actually start to uh to raise rates here i'm actually I would be willing to bet that the, a curve flattening is the more likely outcome and that then the Fed gets itself in a situation where if they did start to really aggressively raise rates, well, then they invert the yield curve. And we know from history that typically inverted yield curves are, are consistent with further economic stagnation, oftentimes recessions. And so I don't know. They had, they do not have a lot of wiggle room to be able to maneuver here. And so I'm not convinced that we're going to see any really substantive, huge change from the Fed policy side in the coming few years, just because I think they're, they have so little wiggle room and they're so hypersensitive to everything that happens in the financial markets these days. I'd like to throw an outrageous prediction at you and get your reactions. Imagine that We've gotten into this stagflation. The Fed, I predict, will be unable to aggressively raise interest rates because they, they just can't afford to. They, they would bankrupt the federal government and increase the cost of borrowing. It's, there's just too many reasons they can't do that. So I think they have to let inflation run, which means prices run away. And there's a lot of political discontentment. 
and the economy is stagnant. And I predict that what happens is politicians come riding to the rescue and say, wait a minute, we're going to use these theories of modern monetary theory to bail out hardworking people from this mysterious, nobody knows what the cause is of these rising prices. It seems to be a mysterious thing. The fact that we caused it, we don't get that. What we need to do is we need to use more MMT to print up more money in order to increase universal basic income and guarantee jobs and so forth to help the good people of the country cope with this inflation, which seems to come out of nowhere. Nobody knows where it came from. Well, actually, you and I do, but they don't. Um, Here's what I think happens. At that point, Warren Mosler and Stephanie Kelton and all of the other smart MMTers who actually know what they're talking about. And I definitely think Warren and Stephanie know what they're talking about. They have a, an ideology about the role of government that, that disagrees with mine. That's the only reason we can't see eye to eye is because we think about things differently. But they understand the inflation risk. They raise their hands and say, hey, politicians, wait a minute. We invented this stuff. We're, you know, the whole thing, you, you can't try to fight inflation with MMT. That's where I think the politicians say, well, thank you for your assistance. We're done with you now. Um, goodbye, Warren. Goodbye, Stephanie. We're going to take this MMT thing and run with it in Washington, in, uh, you know, in the Congress. And uh, we're going to pass a bunch of stuff. We're going to print more money in order to fight the inflation by giving more money out so people will have more money to help contribute to the inflation. And there's a few loan economists on the sidelines saying, guys, there's a whole lot of theory in books that says that you're going to make it worse by doing this. And then politicians go on TV and say, don't you deserve to have universal basic income? Ignore those stupid academics. They don't know anything. Uh, I think that that's coming in the next 10 years. I, I really do. God, I, I mean, I hope you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I, um, let's, let's schedule you back in 10 of... years to ridicule me for being wrong. <laughs> I would love that. Um, I don't know. Maybe I, I tend to be sort of a naive optimist about the world. In fact, a lot of my underlying worldview is just based on this general, general view that, that things are generally better than a lot of us appreciate um, them for being. But um, I won't I won't get into that because that'll piss. I'll get a whole bunch of hate mail from from your audience if I get too deep in the weeds on that stuff. But I'm not convinced that, um, you know, the big thing with an MMT policy response is this job guarantee because that's their big pro cyclical mover from the policy side. That's the thing that the government basically stands by and is they make a market in employment and they're just a willing supplier of labor to anyone and everyone who wants it. And I'm not, I'm not really convinced that the world is really that close to that, that position. I, I do agree with you. I think that the, I think there is a real significant risk that we've sort of convinced ourselves that we can paper over any recession going forward. And so that any downturn will respond to with, more and more policy. But I'm not convinced yet that in these times of like things look pretty good right now. And I'm I'm convinced that the the majority of practical thinkers, if there are such things in Congress, I'm convinced still that the the policymakers will defer towards this approach of at least some balance where we're not we're not just in this position yet where we're only stepping on the gas all the time every time we see a problem in the economy. And so, or at least in, during the good times, I mean, where this would become really a, a problematic, really pro-cyclical thing where you were stepping on the pedal even when things were really good. And so I, I feel like there's there's some easing of fiscal policy at this point. I'm I'm confident that some sort of counter-cyclical measures will continue to be in place, at least in the near term. But yeah, I mean, you're you're definitely right that the political winds seem to be changing somewhat going forward in that we've definitely convinced ourselves, it seems like, that recessions going forward are things that we can just, you know, paper over and, you know, fiscal policy ourselves out of going forward. And whether that transforms into a situation where we have this really hyper pro cyclical policy response in place all the time, where you just have, you know, huge government programs all the time, like a a universal basic income and or a job guarantee combined with like a perpetual, you know, green new deal type of program, you know, something like that. I, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, And I hope, again, I hope you're wrong about us potentially going there. 
So in a weird way, you know, I go back to Keynes in a lot of ways. I think that people misunderstood who Keynes really was and what he really stood for because he was a true counter-cyclical policy advocate in that he really, in the good times, he wanted us to run true counter-cyclical policies. And we've never really adhered to that sort of a policy, even though, you know, a lot of people claim that Keynes is the cause of all of the fiscal policy problems in the world. And I think if Keynes were alive today, he would be considered a, a sort of a moderate Republican in a lot of his, his views, because he'd probably be advocating right now for like a lower, a much lower budget deficit, potentially a budget surplus and true counter-cyclical policies. And I think a lot of people have forgotten the value of that sort of thinking and that sort of counter-cyclical thinking. And it's resulting in the the risk that you mentioned, where we have this risk of a of a very hyper pro cyclical sort of policy response that does, you know, create this risk of of high inflation in perpetuity. Yeah, personally, I think of Keynesian counter cyclical policy as something that is theoretical and has never been attempted or tried. And the reason I say that. Give me an example. What Keynes prescribed is that when times are bad, the government should borrow money and use it to stimulate the economy. And as soon as times get good, Keynes said the government should pay it back, all of it. Tell me, you're an expert in, in monetary history, Cullen. Tell me, please enumerate the examples from history where governments borrowed a bunch of money following Keynes's prescription in bad times and then followed the rest of his prescription and paid it all back as soon as they could. Yeah, wait, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll count them off right for you right now. Just sit tight. There, there's none. I mean, you're right. It's never really, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about the history of Keynes and, and his ideas is that, you know, even though he's broadly considered as this great economist, nobody really actually tried his ideas in, in a realistic sense. And obviously, you know, a big part of that is that, you know, you see this, the way Washington works now is that, you know, politicians get sort of drunk on power and drunk on the ability to, you know, send checks to people and do things for their constituents that they they think will make them better, even though, you know, they might not be. And so it, it's it's very hard to get people to understand the philosophy that, you know, sometimes it's it's OK for the government to step back and let the private sector take the reins during a boom and that, you know, we don't necessarily need to always have this, this fire engine standing by ready to, you know, spray an entire truckload of water on a match that goes off in the economy. And so I'm not a big advocate of, of letting the economy burn in a period where things are really bad. But I, I also do, I sympathize increasingly with this view that, we have become just so hyper reactive to every single downturn. I mean, it's like, I mean, I operate in the stock market every day and it's it's crazy to me that a 20% downturn in the stock market used to be just, the, that's just the way things work. And that's the business we're in and you get used to that. And, you know, you just, you learn to live with it and you learn to navigate it and that's the business we're in. And that became... You know, I was shocked at the number of, for instance, investment advisors and investment firms that took PPP loans. I mean, the business we're in is the business of risk management and this acceptance that sometimes the economy booms and sometimes it busts and you have to manage your portfolios and your asset allocations in a prudent manner that, you know, yeah, you want to capture some of the upside risk, but you have to understand that the, the flip side of that is that you're potentially going to have some negative volatility there. And it seems like we've become so hypersensitive to any sort of downturn that, you know, in a lot of ways, it seems like we all need a little bit of handholding during these downturns. And I worry increasingly about the, the sensitivity of the economy to the financial markets in particular, because we've become so increasingly dependent on these financial asset booms that it's forced policymakers in a lot of ways to become hyper responsive to them. And, you know, like I said, I, I, it worries me that we, we don't seem to be able to stomach a little bit of, um, of pain that in the long term can actually, you know, in a sort of Nassim Taleb methodology, you know, make us more anti-fragile in the long run. And so, you know, again, I'm not, 
I'm not a big advocate of like I, I understand the need for the government and I understand the argument that the government can do certain things that the private sector is not good at. Um, but at the same time, you can you can have these environments where we're, we it feels like we are veering in some some ways towards that world that you're talking about where we all need handholding all the time. And I just I don't know, maybe I grew up too influenced by my Marine father that uh, <laughs> that that that's not necessarily the best way to live life. But um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a legitimate worry. I, I don't think we're there yet. I hope we're not going in that direction. Colin, I want to take all of these fascinating views that you've shared with us and translate it into what our listeners like the most, which is actionable trading ideas. You've talked about a lot of really high-level ideas here, monetary policy, MMT, stagflation, future of the economy. How do I translate all this into portfolio construction ideas? Why don't we go through the various macro asset classes, starting with equities? What's your outlook? A lot of people think that maybe the top is in, and you know, it seems to me like every time somebody says that, they print some more money, and it's it's back to the races again. But we've gone without a new high in the S and P for oh my gosh, more than a month now. I think that might be a record. <laughs> um, <laughs> where's this all headed? Yeah, I've. Well, if you if you know the answer, <laughs> give me a call afterwards and let me know. But um, no, I mean, I to me, I think that um, the current environment. I I don't pretend to know. I like to think of the stock market as a super long duration instrument. So I don't I don't pretend or allocate assets in a way that tries to capture you know near term alpha or anything like that. So I'm looking at the stock market as sort of a long term instrument, and I would argue that. Yeah, I mean, today, every everything or at least a lot of the evidence is consistent with an environment where the stock market is likely to generate lower future returns going forward. And so we have very high valuations. Typically, what happens is, um, I mean, from a macroeconomic sense, when you have really I mean, a strong underlying economy to some degree and uh, primarily a falling unemployment rate that's that's falling as fast as it is, typically – corporations become over leveraged to labor. And so if the economy were to, you know, for instance, become a little weaker, they would delever labor some, and that would actually exacerbate the weakness in the economy to some degree. So we're in this really weird equity environment where the economy, I think you can make an argument that the the stock market boom is not done yet, but that the the likelihood of lower expected returns in the future is higher. And more importantly, the likelihood of increased instability. My view is not just that the, not necessarily that the stock market is going to generate negative returns for long periods of time, but that it will generate lower and more volatile returns going forward. So you'll see events like March 2020 having this really big impact on these markets that are becoming increasingly fragile because everyone is so has become so dependent to a large degree on the underlying policy response. And so, you know, whether or not you actually end up getting those policy responses is still questionable to some degree. And I think that the the fragility in the markets that we're we're likely to see will reflect that. So I would position equity allocations to expect that they will not necessarily look as exuberant as they did, for instance, in the last 10 years. Let's talk about the U.S. dollar. A lot of people think the dollar is doomed because of all the money printing. And I kind of think, wait a minute, the dollar index is a relative measure, mostly against the euro and a basket of other currencies. Do these guys think the ECB is like the, the beacon of fiscal responsibility? <laughs> or like, why is the dollar on a relative basis going to crash relative to the euro if both central banks are doing the same stuff? I'm, I'm with you on that one. It's... Um, you know, at the end of the day, as um, as bad as the policy response is, the politicians have not watered down or destroyed the fact that the U.S. is still comprised of the largest, most productive, most innovative corporations in the world. And that's the thing that really gives the dollar and our currency its reserve status and its value in the world. It's It is the ultimate thing that gives it gives the government all the power that it has too. the fact that our economy, the underlying entities are so dynamic and so strong. I mean, that's where the government derives its ability to do all the things that it does in the first place. And so, you know, my view is that that's not changing 
to today or tomorrow or in the next 10 years. And so I, I think that a lot of people exaggerate this idea that the, the U.S. dollar is going to lose its reserve currency status. And sure, that might it might change some in a relative basis. But like you allude to, you know, who's going to topple it? The Europeans aren't doing anything that is superior in any great way. The Chinese, I mean, you've seen all of the, the measures in China. I mean, they're not really opening their markets that much, or at least, you know, we it kind of looked like they were becoming a lot more, you know, sympathetic to capitalism in the last 10 years. And in the last sort of 18 to 24 months, we've sort of seen this big, you know, 180 in the way that they're kind of handling a lot of their domestic corporations and the freedoms there. So I don't know who who or what economy is going to topple it, no matter, you know, and I'm not fully convinced that U.S. politicians are going to be able to, you know, completely erode and devalue the, you know, the, the great corporations that we have in the United States, especially on a relative basis. So, yeah, I mean, ultimately, currency trading is a zero sum game. So I don't do I don't do a lot of, of business in that market, but I'm not convinced that the dollar crashing is is some sort of great risk going forward. Let's talk about interest rates and bond yields then, because this seems to me, I mean, normally I think of what fixed income guys do is they analyze the economy and they think about fundamental drivers that ought to affect interest rates. It seems to me like we kind of gave up on that whole system and replaced it with one where policy is basically the determinant of interest rates more than anything else, more than natural economic factors. And furthermore, the policies themselves are so politically contentious that they change very quickly. So how the heck do you make sense and trade a market like that? It's yeah, it's hard. I mean, the the short term, you know, I like to use the analogy of the the bond market or the, you know, the interest rate curve is a lot like a like someone walking a dog and the, you know, the Fed is the the dog walker basically and that the they let the 30 year kind of do what it's going to do. It, you know, it wanders from side to side of the sidewalk and you know it poops where it wants to and pisses where it wants to but the at the the short end the fed has ultimate control obviously and so they can they can explicitly control exactly what that rate is and so well the short rate is exactly a function of whatever the overnight market is is pegged at the long end is still a at least somewhat a determinant of of what future economic outlooks appear to be. And I think the bond market is sending the Fed a pretty a pretty strong signal in that what I think what they're saying, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, that the the 30-year Treasury bond, for instance, is telling the Fed, you know, hey, you don't have a lot of wiggle room here. You know, we're not gonna, if you guys, you know, if you tighten up your leash, you know, we might come back and and bite you on the hand. And so the Fed does not have a lot of wiggle room. And like I said, Earlier, I think that the risk of a of a curve flattener and sort of a repeat of this sort of Greenspan conundrum scenario, that becomes a real risk if the Fed starts really talking about raising rates. And so, you know, on the on the long end, you know, I counter to a lot of people, I actually would argue that a lot of the risk is on the short end because the Fed might raise rates there and jam short-term bondholders. Whereas on the long end, I'm not convinced that the long end is going to spike in the way that some people have expected it to. And that in fact, if policymakers and the Fed continue to jawbone about reducing the balance sheet and potentially raising interest rates, I wouldn't be shocked if we saw a big curve flattening. And you know, we could be potentially talking about an inverted yield curve again here in the next, you know, not in the near term, but who knows, next, you know, three, four years, potentially. Colin, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, I want to ask you about the Discipline Fund ETF. Uh, why did you launch an ETF at this particular point in your career? And what specifically is the Discipline Fund ETF? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, so, well, I mean, in a world where, like we've been talking about, I mean, it seems feels like so many things are undisciplined. And, you know, I find that it, over the course of my career, to me, so much of portfolio management is about trying to help people manage behavior. And the the fund, the new ETF that we started, the Discipline Fund, is it's essentially just a very simple market cap weighted fund of funds. You own six underlying stock and bond ETFs. So it's 10,000 underlying holdings, super diversified. But what the fund does is it builds a core holding for investors that 
will hopefully help them maintain and sort of stay the course through thick and thin over time. And the kicker with this fund is that unlike a traditional index fund, which always rebalances back to a static weighting, this fund actually rebalances counter cyclically. So kind of talking about the way that, you know, I think the economy should be run. This thing sets a benchmark rate, which is approximately a 50-50 stock bond allocation, and it rebalances dynamically to actually try to account for the underlying risk, the relative risks of the stock versus the bond market. And so like right now, the fund is about a 45-55 stock bond allocation, which is consistent with an environment where the, the fund is essentially telling you that the, the risks in the equity market are elevated. So we're a little bit underweight stocks. And so if the, if the stock market were to go through a big bust here, the fund would do it would counter cyclically rebalance in the opposite direction. So it's it's an index fund in essence that rebalances more dynamically than something like a 60-40, which kind of always assumes that the the your equity exposure, especially in the 60% piece, is sort of always static and that you're always exposed to the same amount of risk. When we kind of know, historically speaking, the 60% piece exposes you to a lot more risk at certain times than it does at other times. And so this fund rebalances counter cyclically to try to better adjust for potential future expected returns and hopefully instill literally a sense of discipline and better behavior in people so that they can better navigate the uncertainties of the financial market returns in the future. Well, Colin, I can't thank you enough, and we look forward to getting you back for an update soon. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Escrow.com is the payment system for buying and selling anything of value. Cars, boats, airplanes, jewelry, gemstones, fine art, collectibles, intellectual property rights, domain names, bringing in shipping containers from overseas, or even buying and selling entire businesses. It's simple to use. Either party sets up the transaction. Then the buyer sends the funds to escrow.com. The seller is then instructed to send the goods to the buyer to inspect. Within the inspection period, the buyer can return the items for any reason. After that, Escrow.com pays the seller immediately. Escrow.com is the world's most secure payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Over 2 million customers have transacted over $5 billion on escrow.com. And eBay and Shopify use it for cars, boats, luxury watches, and business sales. It's available in the United States, Canada, and Australian dollars, euros, and British pounds. Never buy or sell anything online unless you use escrow.com. Escrow.com is a subsidiary of freelancer.com. Listed on the OTCQX best markets under the ticker symbol FLNCF, and the Australian Securities Exchange under the ticker FLN. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it's great to have Colin on the show. It's always great to get his insights. I look forward to here just uh, pulling up some charts and uh, putting some perspective on some of those views. Uh, let's, uh, let's have a look at it. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, it means you're not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, click the red button that says Looking for the Downloads. Patrick, the chart deck is titled Breakout. What do we have on page two? Looks like the S&P chart. Right. So uh, I want to start with actually page three, where we highlighted past market corrections and uh, the kind of bear market rallies, not bear market rallies, or at least the reactionary rallies that happened midway through the corrections. And each of them lasts sometimes as long as a month and, and often have multiple legs higher that mean revert a good chunk of the market move. Now, I'm not in any way saying that that's guaranteed to play out this way, but when we go to chart two and look at this chart, chart. When you draw just a, a, a descending trend line along the previous highs, it looks like today's candle is a breakout bullishly to the upside that typically is going to spur many traders to want to get long this market. But if we use the analog of the, that previous chart, we're actually at a very sensitive moment as we get into the next like 20 to 50 S&P points higher. Because if, it, if this continues to be a prolonged market correction that may have one more corrective leg 
leg left in it, then we should see that the S&P 500 starts to struggle to, uh, to make much more progress than it is today. And uh, the only way that I really think that the bulls are really in the clear is if there's some legit bullish follow through and we see some of that sector rotation that's been coming out of things like the fangs and NASDAQ start to really rotate back in. And it's certainly a possibility that the bulls may take it, uh, control, but I still think the jury's out and I think it's going to be a very important week next week to see whether or not there's any follow through after we roll off the uh, October OPEX. Well, I couldn't agree more, Patrick, that next week is really important, and we are at kind of a pivotal moment here. The place where I might disagree slightly is, I just admit, I have no clue which way it goes from here, because I really think this market is tired and needs to go down. But look at what the last several years have shown us about every time I think that's the way it's supposed to go. It seems like all this central bank largesse just fuels more and more asset price inflation. So I don't certainly don't want to be short here. I'm, I'm happy to be trading crude oil on the sidelines. You know, the, the one uh, pushback that a lot of people have on uh, the bull advancing from here is, is the fact that we're really entering a phase where monetary policy may start to tighten with some tapering. And uh, if we had a market that just kept rallying, I think that that would be a green light for the Fed to actually tighten policy. I'm wondering whether or not the market needs to have a little tantrum in order to get the, the Fed to kind of back off from its current policy. And I mean, that's certainly the argument to be made that the correction could continue, but we'll see. I mean, that's, uh, I think it won't take more than a week or more to find out really what uh, the market has in store. Nonetheless, uh, let's uh, jump to the uh, US dollar chart that we were talking about in the market wrap earlier, showing there the, the, those October, November, highs of the dollar index and interestingly enough at least the, uh, the dollar has bumped its head here but I really think that beyond a quick little pullback that often is like one 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 and a half points here it'll be really interesting to see whether it's bought on dip and defended I mean when we go and think back to what Russell Napier was saying about the dollar and making a case that there's room for the dollar to strengthen it'll be really interesting to see whether characteristics of bull trend remain in here and it, it, one biggest characteristic is all dips get bought and so as one of these corrections comes in, it usually is a really big tell to see whether or not it's accumulated quickly on any weakness. But in any event, Patrick, let's move on to my favorite chart, which is crude oil futures. I've been dying to ask you about this one because when we talked to our listeners back in oh, April or so, I was saying, boy, look at that nice big bull move from November up through the middle of March, and then we saw a correction. And a lot of big rallies, you'll see a pattern where you get about halfway through, and then there's a significant correction at the midpoint, and then you get the second half of the big rally. I thought that was the halfway point in March there, Patrick. I'm starting to think that this July-August correction is the real halfway point. And if you do a measured move on that, you end up over 100 bucks. What do you think? Oh, that definitely is the bigger measured move. But that's uh, a more realistically like a, a six-month target. And I think that uh, before we start targeting 100, I think the first thing to, to see is where a new midpoint occurs. So my, my view here at this stage is that it's very easy for crude oil at this point to even temporarily punch up toward $85. At some point, we're going to be uh, have a scenario where the rally is checked and there's going to be some sort of a a reactionary correction that just washes out some short-term trend chasers and uh, it creates a base. If that shows that the price is being very well defended, that could be the platform from which a, a launch to 100 could really happen. But I think that uh, 100 is more now a, a 2022 story. Really, I think uh, the key here is is that uh, how much more gas is in the tank for, for a punch higher before we see a consolidation. I think 85 is possible. Uh, maybe 90 is pushing it, but I think a few dollars is definitely still on the table. Patrick, let's move on to the energy ETF on page six. Right. And uh, what's really interesting is, is that we are seeing energy stocks really participating. Now, it is a, a mixed bag. There are, there are certain sectors of this that are uh, within there that are not fully punching new highs yet. Like, for instance, oil service stocks and other uh, sectors um, haven't yet, uh, did that. even the refiners have not really punched to new highs. But there, we are seeing that these energy stocks are playing game to the upside. This certainly does leave the window open for them to continue high 
higher still. Maybe we're going to see 110, 115 or even higher on this. What will be really interesting to see is whether this trend of energy companies participating with oil price uh, continues. And that's uh, uh, right now, certainly when you own a stock like um, or an ETF like this uh, XOP, it certainly has given you uh, proper participation on the upside. Patrick, let's move on to gold futures on page seven. Boy, bumping right up against that descending trend line. Are we going to get through it this time? Yeah, I know. And then there's a 100-day moving average you were referencing earlier. That's all at this. It's just such an important moment on gold. Every time we've seen gold have one of these types of pops over the last six months, each time it faded the rally. And uh, this is going to be one of the big tells. Uh, At some stage, when a trend transitions from distribution to a new bull trend, you see that the uh, old dips start being defended and the price action starts to roll up off of small dips. And so um, this breakout itself is really worth paying attention to. But what's going to be the real tell is, well, will we see that by next week we faded the entire breakout and we're back to 1750? Or do do the bulls follow through this time? What is interesting is when we go to page eight and look at the gold miners themselves, that descending trend line has definitely bullishly broken out. And more importantly, the entire September sell-off in uh, the GDX has now been wiped out to the upside, which is uh, typically a characteristic that you would see on a turn point. In many cases, a lot of uh, traders will chase the, the miners themselves and front run the gold moves. So maybe this is a, a sort of a canary in the coal mine that uh, that gold might be turning the corner, but I, I never trust one or two days in a new trend. So the next week is going to be incredibly important to determine whether or not these bulls have follow through here. Patrick, I couldn't agree more with what you said, but I want to go back to page seven for a second and just get your read on where this is headed. Because the way I see this, as you just said a moment ago, we need to see a break here around, you know, approximately 1800. We need to get above 1800 and stay there for a few days. That gives me confidence that, okay, maybe finally this is, uh, you know, going the right direction. I would then be saying it's about 1920, which would be that high from back at the end of May or beginning of June. If we can get above that and stay there, to me, that would be the signal that says, okay, now it's really game on. We're, we're, we're in the next leg of the bull market, and maybe we're headed to 2500 or whatever comes next. Would you agree with that, or how should we read the, the, the cards as far as what comes next in this market? Well, sure. I mean, a break above 1920 is technically uh, going to be a confirmation, but that's not when you should be doing your buying. There's not uh, often not a lot of asymmetry if you're waiting for 52-week highs to start brand new buying. I mean, really, the way I look at this is that uh, gold just needs to demonstrate the characteristic of higher highs and higher lows and price action defended and everything rolling up. Then you could put money to work here. And then in the much bigger picture, like on weekly charts, well, whether gold's heading to you know 2200 or 2500 over the course of a year or two those kind of moves would be confirmed by a break above 1920 but that by then it will be a full bull move uh, i don't think i'd wait till there to start buying well patrick i've been watching the macro voices email inbox and we're getting listeners writing us saying how come you guys have never covered uranium don't you know anything uranium is hot now you should cover it Um, Actually, folks, we covered uranium back when it was time to buy it. That's why we haven't covered it recently. Let's take a look at the chart, though, on page 10. Well, for sure. I mean, we had some great uranium guests on in the past, but uh, really it is interesting to see this very strong breakout in uranium that happened uh, over the last uh, couple of months. There was an extraordinary rip higher. Often people are suggesting that it was the uh, the shift in, in the Sprott physical uranium fund that uh, has really started to, to shift the supply and demand in the market. One way or another, the prices of uranium have definitely punched up to the $50 mark, but more importantly, this recent dip has now been bought. And I think that that's a, an, the characteristic uh, that suggests that there could be continuation. What is interesting is when we take a look at the actual uranium companies, and we're going to use that North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF, the URNM, that has sponsored our show in the past, and just show how very bullish this ETF has been. The entire pullback was held to just like a 50% retracement of its prior rise, 
bullishly breakout candles ripping right back there. If they can clear that uh, previous high and get it up to the 100 plus mark, maybe this thing has uh, enough gas in the tank for a, a move to 110, 120 on the upside. Definitely uranium continues to look very bullish on its characteristics and there could definitely be some more upside here. Well, speaking of metals and mining, Patrick, let's take a look at copper futures because, boy, I've been asking this question for a while now. I, I think the, the argument for copper, long argument, is very, very strong. Bullish argument, excellent argument, except that, boy, look at how far it's gone in the last year and a half. I, is the correction over? It looks like maybe it is. Well, this is the really interesting part, right? So ever since that kind of May-June high that we saw on copper, we have more or less seen uh, what was a solid three, four-month consolidation as a, as that extraordinary bull run just needed to pause and backfill. That's a very common technical occurrence. But what the key always is to watch is when one of the corrections or consolidation starts to bullishly break out. And there's no denying that the last week, the last link four trading, session has really put together some really good back-to-back -back breakout days that really uh, is the first kind of advertisement that maybe the the new bull run has started. I, I think that uh, watching whether or not the bulls can hold these gains and, and build on it is going to be really important. What's really uh, powerful about this is that if this is a, the, a new breakout, this is the, only the first second innings of uh, the next leg of the advance. Unlike uranium, which is much might arguably uh, be already in the sixth, seventh innings of their move. If copper is breaking out, this is much earlier in the cycle, and there might be a lot more money to be made. And you can really see that when you go to the copper miners ETF on page 12, where you can really see that uh, these copper miners have been in the doghouse for, for quite a while with a 20 to 30% correction over the course of those uh, four or five months. And really at this stage with this uh, bullish breakout occurring here, a big question to ask as to whether the next leg of a big copper bull market is already underway. Uh, that's 100% what I'm going to be watching with my members next week. And listeners, if you want to be watching with Patrick and his members next week, you can do that for free by signing up for a free membership at Big Picture Trading. You can do that at BigPictureTrading.com or get the data off of page 13 of the chart deck. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better serve the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Escrow.com, the world's most secure online payment system from a counterpart risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. Well, this week you're going to find the transcript for today's interview as well as a link to the chart book that we just discussed in this post game. There's also a link to a Jesse Felder article, Where Are We in the Market Cycle? And a Harley Bassman interview as Boomers Are Like Locusts. You'll, you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that's Eric spelled with a K, and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. 
And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.